The first reading is from Mark chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. The destruction of the temple foretold. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth of collection of readings on hope from the Bible. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. From Romans. So let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. We are not among those who shrink back and so are lost, but among those who have faith and thus are saved. From Hebrews. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction or evidence of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Again, Hebrews. And may the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with each other. And, and may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. From Romans. Hope is the thing with feathers, which was written about 1861, is a popular poem by the American poet Emily Dickinson. It's one of a number of poems by Dickinson that breathes new life into an abstract concept by using surprising imagery and figurative language. In the poem, hope is metaphorically transformed into a strong-willed bird that lives within the human soul and sings its song no matter what. Essentially, the poem seeks to remind readers of the power of hope and how little it requires the speaker makes it clear that hope has been helpful at times of difficulty and has never asked for anything in return. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest, in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash that little bird and keep it so many warm. I've heard it in the chilliest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity, 
it asked a crumb of me. Well, I have to admit that um, when I uh, read today's gospel story, I thought, no way, no way am I going to preach on that. I want to uh, have something far more hopeful. Um, the reading itself comes from me as the beginning of the 13th chapter of Mark, which is often entitled... Um, the, the little apocalypse. And after starting with this story of the foretelling of the uh, destruction of the temple, uh, it goes on with Jesus saying that his followers are going to be uh, persecuted. And then there's a lot of images about the lights of the stars going out, the sun and the moon. Light is going to be dimmed before a triumphal return of the Son of Man uh, in the last days. And you can imagine this sort of imagery gave me a fit of the heebie-jeebies, uh, particularly since I started preparing on Halloween. It was not a good, good night to do it. Uh, but on reflection, I thought, um, yes, these are issues which um, need to be explored by people of faith who proclaim a gospel of hope in a, in, a, in a very threatening world. We can't really fully understand why Jesus said these words or the context in which he said them, or indeed whether he really whether these really were the, the words that Jesus used. But we do know, of course, that they were written down by the author of Mark's Gospel, around the year 70 uh, CE, when indeed the temple had been destroyed, uh, when his, the followers of Jesus were being persecuted, and when civilization, as the Jewish people knew it, was in a state of crisis. Now, a lot has been speculated about the theological significance of the destruction of the temple story. It's usually interpreted as signalling the overturning of an old sacrificial system of temple worship and the ushering in of a new Messianic age of justice and freedom based on faith in the life, teachings, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But I don't want to go down the theological track this morning. Uh, rather, I want to reflect on the sad fact that uh, through the ages, people of faith have had to come to terms with forewarnings of violence, of persecutions, and of existential threats. Uh, in our own time, I think all of us have lived through uh, waves of such warnings and of them becoming realities. How many wars and rumours of wars, nations rising up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, have there been in our own day? Not to mention, of course, earthquakes, famines, floods and hurricanes. Uh, fear rather than faith seems to over, overtake our current age. Uh, scenarios of bleak futures are, uh, are plausible on many fronts. Since COVID, uh, we have become anxious about even deadlier pandemics like the bird flu, which is currently raging and possibly will be transmitted to humans. Ecosystems are breaking down around us. Uh, political events in the US in the last couple of weeks, of course, have been uh, 
worrying about the breaking down of international relations. And even here in Australia, many of us are worried that uh, our grandchildren face the prospect of being poorer uh, than we ourselves have been during our lifetimes. And I think I detect a fear even in Woden Valley United Church that without more young people, our congregation may wither away within a decade or so. Now, of course, we hope all these things won't happen, but are these hopes pipe dreams? Can we have faith in hope? Today's readings from the from Romans and Hebrews do have something to say about this, but I think they require uh, a little bit about unpacking. As I tried to go about unpacking them this week, and I say try, I don't know whether I succeeded, I have to acknowledge that I um, came, I, I was helped by a podcast I came across by a, a professor, Wolf, uh, from the Yale uh, Center for Faith and Culture in the US. I acknowledge that at the end of the order of service, if you'd like to uh, turn to that podcast at some, at some time afterwards. Uh, Wolf starts with Paul's statement in Romans that we started with in our readings from Romans. In hope we have been saved. Now elsewhere, Paul, of course, says that it's by grace through faith that we've been saved. It's a very famous passage in Ephesians. But I don't see any reason why we shouldn't uh, roll the two uh, statements up together and say by grace through faith and hope we have been saved. The verses that we've read, I think, suggest that grace, faith and hope seem to all exist together. And in fact, they're very easily interchangeable words. In his reflection on these verses, Wolf turns to Emily Dickinson's poem that we've read, Hope is a Thing of Feathers. Here are some of the words that uh, Wolf used as he interpreted the poem. Hope is a thing with feathers perched in the soul, ready to take us on its wings to some future good. In fact, hope is a thing that already has taken us to that future good with the tune that it sings. Hope is being ready to be taken to some future good to a good place, if you like, a future that we can't see but will overcome the bad places. For Emily Dickinson, these bad places were the stormy gale, her chilliest land, her strangest sea. Emily is said to have suffered from bouts of melancholy all through her life. And I suspect that these lines uh, of the poem reflect some of that melancholy. Hope didn't remove these bad things from her life, but it perched in her soul, helping her to set them aside, creating a future of good things but didn't just come as a matter of course. Hope won't prevent bad things from happening. Optimistic hope that bad things will simply go away is the complete antithesis of the evidence-based faith in things hoped for but not yet seen that the author of Hebrews Hebrews writes about. 
hoping that climate change will go away is foolish hope. Evidence assembled by the World Meteorological Organization tells us that there's more than 80% chance that global temperatures in the next few years are going to exceed their pre-industrial levels by more than 1.5 degrees. Now that said, when we hope I think we must always hope or be prepared to hope outside the loop of reasonable expectations. Emily Dickinson's bird of hope is in the storm, but not of it. It flies through the storm, but it perches in her soul. Now this is poetic imagery, but is there something in her words that's more than beautiful poetry? Let me remind you of something that comes from history. When Bartholomew Dias sailed past the southern tip of Africa in 1488, he called that tip Cabo das Tormentalis the Cape of Storms, because of the bad weather that he was experiencing as he sailed. However, when he returned, the King of Portugal renamed the Cape Cabo de Boa Esperanto, the Cape of Good Hope, to start to express his optimism that the Cape's discovery would open up a sea route to India and the far, far East. For the king, good hope triumphed over bad storms. I, I did originally say Trump, but I guess that's not the word to say today. I might say there's a little hamlet uh, south east, southwest of Yes called Good Hope. I wonder what how it got its name. I don't know, but I did. I did uh, email the historical society of Yes to ask them if they could tell me. But I haven't got a reply from them yet. But when I do, I'll let you know. <laughs> Emily Dickinson's little bird also transcended the bad storms with good hope. But it never gets hung up on words, never gets hung up on words like bad or good. The tune that it sings is a tune without words. And it never asks for anything in return. Yet its song doesn't come cheap as it sorely battles through the gales. Paul also saw that salvation didn't, salvation through faith and hope doesn't come cheap. <clears throat> he wrote, if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. Some other translations say we wait for it with endurance. Emily Dickinson's little bird brought hope as it endured the tempest with its singing. In his podcast, Bolf draws our attention to a book on the theology of hope written by Jürgen Montmann, an eminent German theologian who died just two or three months ago. Moltmann wrote, without endurance, hope becomes superficial and evaporates when it meets the first resistance. In hope, we start something new, but only endurance brings us, uh, uh, helps us to persevere. Only tenacious endurance makes hope sustainable. We learn endurance with the help of hope. 
I think that Maltman is saying that both hope and endurance require each other. And he reminds us that for Paul, in Romans 15, the last verses that we wrote in that selection this morning, both hope and endurance seem to be part of the very character of God. In, he writes, may the God of steadfastness and, in, and encouragement, I think we can say the God of endurance, grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and says, and may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, a God of endurance and God, a God of hope. Now, I don't suppose that anything that I've been reflecting on, we've been reflecting on, will set at rest my hebe when I read the account of the little apocalypse in Mark. Of course it won't. And, and I still believe that uh, we have an existential uh, crisis when it comes to uh, climate change and ask the question, can humanity survive? And I guess I share those anxieties with you because they rack this time and none of us can avoid them. But I'd still like to end on a note of hope. Throughout September this year, we celebrated with other Christians around the world something which we called the season of creation. The theme that was chosen for that celebration was titled The First Fruits of Hope. Now, that's a phrase that's contained in a well-known passage that also comes from Romans 8 about the whole creation waiting with eager longing to be set free from its bondage of decay and to obtain the freedom for which the children of God hope. It's a passage that's rich with imagery. One of those images is that the creation groans with labour pains while it waits for hope for creation's renewal. Now, I wonder if it's just a coincidence that Jesus used the same image when he said that the temple's destruction was to be just the beginning of the birth pangs of something new that was about to follow. Out of our anxieties and despairs, I'm sure that new ways of thinking and doing will emerge. We may hope for that great ultimate renewal of creation, which is embedded in Christian dreaming. But along the way, there will be many, many new creations that we need to help create, and bring about with endurance and perseverant hope. So with Emily Dickinson, I'd like to end by remembering that hope is a thing of feathers. Let it perch within our souls. Let it sing its melody without the need for our words. Let it keep us warm amidst the chilliest of storms. And let it never, never stop at all.